who pushed in the 1800s for a long time to get an official Mother's Day. There were people that celebrated the Mother's Day, but there wasn't an official, you know, they were kind of making an official government. When I was a kid growing up, there were two Thanksgivings, you know, the fourth Thursday in November and the last Thursday in November. So if there happened to be five Thursdays, some of the family met with some of the family, you know. So here's Peppermint Patty. I learned something this week. Her name is spelled P-A-T-T-Y. And she's sitting, writing something, a little boy comes up. And what she's writing says, Happy Father's Day from your rare Jim. And then she looks up and says, Hi, Roy, I suppose you're wondering what I'm doing. I just made my dad a handmade Father's Day card. Every now and then, my dad says to me, Peppermint Patty, do you know what you are? <laughs> and I always say no. Then he says to me, you are a rare gem. And we both laugh. So you see, I made a card for him. Happy Father's Day from your rare gem. And Roy says, that's very nice. She says, I think I'll, thank you, I'll put it on the top of his dresser where he'll see it. So she pushes it up there and she says, actually, Anyone who gives his dad a Father's Day card is a rare chip. <laughs> you can tell Peppermint Patty and her father love each other. But she's not too sentimental about Father's Day. Like Mother's Day and Grandparents' Day, Father's Day was set up by people to be regarded as they choose. So like, I've heard people say, Mother's Day you got to make it Mother's Weekend, you know, take her out to, I remember one time many, many years ago, Maryland's folks were in Trenton, Florida, about 140 miles north of here, and we decided to go up, and it, I didn't keep, it happened to be Mother's Day, and in, the interstate was crowded, so we took the other highway, big mistake. Every town we went to had a restaurant with its parking lot completely full and cars backed out up and down the street. And you could like never get a town after town after town after town. <laughs> I remember one day, they, one year they wanted to take her mom to a, a place in Brandon. And so we were all meeting there. The parking lot was full. You had to park down the street. There was a line coming out of the restaurant with about 30 people here. So get in the line. When you finally get inside, it's like Disney World. The people are wound all over the restaurant between the tables. And the people that are eating can't enjoy much to me that what they're eating because there's people bumping them all the time. So. I say a hot dog. <laughs> hot dog and a coke, best thing for mother's day. Well, whatever. Well, God says parents are to be honored generally, not one day a year. Ephesians 6.2 says, honor your fathers and mothers. God put requirements on a Christian father just as he puts them on a Christian mother. Children do well to regard the discipline and teaching instilled in them by their parents, especially by God-fearing parents. I realize there's parents that are terrible. We had a kid at, at the academy one time, I told this before, they told us down at the office so we'd understand about this boy. He had a mother and he had a father. The mother lived in St. Louis and the father lived in Jacksonville or Kalamazoo or something like that. Neither one wanted him. So he was living with his aunt and his father was paying the tuition for, for the school. 
And <clears throat> it happened to be Mother's Day. <laughs> and a well-meaning preacher came to the chapel and made a nice, you know, gushy thing about how wonderful mothers are. <laughs> this boy hated his wife. Oh, wow. <laughs> my word, I don't remember why I was there. They had a black box, big black box, up on the stage behind him. After chapel, nobody could find the way he was hiding inside of it. He fritzed out completely. They had to you know, call somebody to take him away to help him. He didn't come back to school anymore. So I realize there's parents like that. We're talking about God-fearing parents and, you know, that kind of thing. So Proverbs 1, 8 through 9, let's read that together. My son... Listen to your father's discipline, and do not neglect your mother's teachings, because discipline and teachings are a graceful garland on your head and a golden chain to ornament your neck. If we learn the discipline and the teachings of our parents, we'll probably have a, a better life than these wild kids that join gangs in the big cities and just rove around and do whatever they want to uh, and nobody cares what they do. That's a terrible, terrible situation. We'll read the back of this uh, later. Since Mother's Day, we talked about mothers. It's only fair to talk about fathers. I think I should do what? Do you think I ought to be able to get up and teach this one? No. You probably haven't thought about mother. I know. Now, I ought to be able to talk about mother. You just have, have to do it away from the assembly. Okay. <laughs> if she gets started, don't listen to her. <laughs> okay. Fathers, before we start, this is not setting up at church, but then you can't always talk about it. Most laws, even laws of God, have exceptions. In Matthew 19, Jesus was talking about marriage, about divorce. And the Jews came and said, can a guy divorce his wife for any old reason? And that's exactly what they did. If they got tired of their wives, they sent her a note. Somebody delivered said, you're divorced. She's out on her ear. That's it. And they were saying, well, isn't that what's supposed to, wait, it's supposed to happen? But Jesus said, the, you know, no. <laughs> it's supposed to be a real serious thing to break a marriage. And then they said, well, if that's the case, maybe you know, maybe people shouldn't get married. And then you come to this. Jesus was speaking in Matthew 19, verses 11 and 12, and he said, Not everybody can receive this teaching except those to whom it's given. Some, he said, are born celibate. There are people who are born, it's like the big secret, but there are people who are born in conditions that prevent them from marrying. That's a burden they have in life, just like somebody born without an arm or somebody born deaf. It's a burden. We, we, don't, all together, we don't have to know why, but that's someone's burden. Some are castrated. They used to castrate slaves that were knowledgeable so they could be a household slave for somebody and well, since them being married and some Jesus said remain single devoting themselves to religion now that's what the Apostle Paul did so not everybody has to concern themselves with the ins and outs of marriage and divorce see there's we knew a lady one time where she went to church to preach for her son. You have a responsibility, he said. 
God means you as a Christian woman to marry and raise children. Now, I promise you, he wasn't reading that from the Bible. And that's what the woman was saying. Where, where did he get that in the Bible? And I said, he didn't get it in the Bible. He made it up. That's sort of like the Mormon thing. Get you a bunch of wives and make more Mormons, you know. And that's certainly not in God's Bible. Now, having said that, there are some fathers who cannot do all that God asks of fathers because, for instance, they might be ill. There are people who become fathers and they have terrible illnesses and live for years ill and have terrible accidents and, and live disabled. That they can't do everything a father's supposed to do. And sometimes it's because of circumstances that are beyond their control. Just for instance, um, I don't know if the case I know I went the other way, but sometimes uh, somebody comes home from work and their mate is, and their child is just gone. The husband and the wife just runs off with the child. Not a word doesn't say, I'm going or anything. That never tells them dead or alive. How can the parent do what a parent's supposed to be when someone has stolen their child or, you know, the mate has stolen them? So there are circumstances in which a father cannot do these things that we're going to read about. Having said that, we're going to think about in terms of, well, not normal situation, you know. So a father is to love his children. Hmm. Second Timothy 3.3, 3, let's read that. For men shall be lovers of their own selves without natural affection. That term is used several times in the Bible, and it means that person doesn't have the natural affection that should exist between a father and a son, between a husband and a wife, between a father and a daughter. Natural affection. And so, when a person doesn't have that natural love that parents are supposed to have for their child and their family, we're warned against such people because God says they only love themselves. That's what the Bible says. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. First, foremost, and always. They're not lovers of God. They're not lovers of society. They're lovers of themselves. Never mind the wife, never mind the child. But it establishes the, the natural situation that parents are to love their children, that fathers are to love their children. It won't always be expressed the same way. But that basic bond of love is to be there. Having said that, what is a loving father to do according to God if he's able? So, number one, a father is in no particular order. Is than what's on the paper. A father is to provide for his children. 1 Timothy 5.8, let's read that. If anyone doesn't take care of his own relatives, especially his immediate family, he has denied the Christian faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So, as the case may be, a husband that runs off and doesn't provide for the wife and children, God says he's denied the Christian faith if he ever had it, and he's worse than an unbeliever. 2 Corinthians 12, 14. Paul was talking about coming back to the church at Corinth. Let's read that. I'm ready to visit you for a third time. And I won't bother you for help. I don't want your possessions. 
Instead, I want you, your souls. Children shouldn't have to provide for their parents, but parents should provide for their children. We live in a society that can't, for all it, it's messing around with it, can't even figure out what a child is. But then on the other hand, it knows what a child is. In my mother's family, there were 13 or, I don't remember, 13 or 15 brothers and sisters and half-brothers and half-sisters. And they had a ceremony for the 18th birthday. They all knew it. On the 18th birthday, they packed a little suitcase for them and wished them a good life. You're on your own. That's what that family did. Now, it wasn't unfair. They did it from, you know, all, everybody knew. So when it was mom's 18th birthday, she knew. She'd already lined up her job, you know, and she grew to live in. Yeah, it was the way things worked. But they said, you're not a child anymore. Get out on your own. So it's not talking about somebody that's 87 being responsible to take care of their 66-year-old child. It can happen, but God doesn't require it. Paul is talking about the normal situation that you see where people have children and they're the parents and they're a family unit and so forth. Paul's spiritual relationship with the Corinthians was like a father. He wanted to provide for them spiritually, not take from them. He made reference to the duties of a father to provide for his children. So that's one thing a father should do. Page two. Father is to teach his children to do what is right. Now, you and I realize millions of fathers don't do that. They don't do it, you know. But God says a father is responsible to that. Proverbs 22, 6. Let's read that. Train a child in the way he should go. Yes. And when he is old, he will not turn away from it. Uh, Roscoe and Betty Knight had a son that had difficulties and wasn't faithful to the church. And where Betty was preaching out of town, Roscoe was preaching out of town, so Betty went to a congregation in town. When the preacher found out about this, every time Betty went to church, every sermon that man preached contained Proverbs 22, 6, and he looked her right in the eye. How terrible, how cruel. And Betty, of course, resented it, and I don't blame her. Proverbs are generalizations. They're the way things normally work. It's like saying you'll get a lot more smiles if you smile at people. Well, yeah, you will. But that's not a law. You can smile at somebody that's scowling and they just I say, what's wrong with you, you idiot? You know. Not a law. However, what a father should do to have the best situation that when his children are older, they won't turn away from the truth is to train a child in the way he should go. Does it mean he will? No. But it makes sense. Deuteronomy 11.19, let's read that. Teach God's will to your children and talk about His will when you're at home or away, when you lie down, 
or get up. Yes. My dad wasn't a preacher. He didn't quote a lot of scripture. But if we were out taking a walk in the evening or something and there were some guys, as they did back then on the back side of an out, ice house where they sold beer, they'd be lined up there with one foot against the wall, pitching coins and knocking down the beer. My dad might say that a good reputation is rather to be chosen than great riches. Well, that's an example of somebody talking about God's will to his children in the process of life. It doesn't all have to be just open that Bible and cut a page out and make the child memorize it. When the father shows that he knows something about God, he says, it's Sunday morning, let's get ready for church. You know, He's teaching, he's teaching, teaching a child the will of God to go to church. Number three, <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris, it really does say this. <laughs> a father is to discipline his children. Unlike our society that says that the teacher who said an unkind word to class to a child in class could be sued by its mother for being humiliated in the classroom. I mean, you know, that's amazing. What does God say? Proverbs 13, 24. Let's read that. Whoever refuses to spank his son hates him. But whoever loves his son disciplines him from early on. That's probably something that parents like less about raising children than anything else. It's probably something that children like less about being a child than anything else. Because they can't do just anything they want to. But having said that, We've seen children nearly killed, nearly killed, for instance, running in front of a car because they just had, you know, unless you better have a hold on because they're not going to respond to a thing you say. Well, did God say, here, spank your child three times a day just in case he needs it? Don't let him say that. It says if you refuse, and the implication is if you refuse all discipline toward your child, That's sad. then you hate your child. Yeah. But, but whoever loves his son has some kind of discipline from early on. I don't remember Heather was our oldest and she was, she could talk yet before we figured out she knew how to lie. You know, I don't remember what it was, but you know, we have to work through that. God doesn't give us a, a, a computer code that we can stick and tell us what to do in every situation. Life is real. So, the next one under Father Disciplines His Child is Proverbs 19.18. Discipline your son while there is still hope. Do not be the one responsible for his death. Because a lack of all discipline can result in death. I knew a guy that when he was a kid, kids pretty much did what they wanted to where he lived. And the guy came around selling what he said was drugs. So he and his friends took their lunch money and gave it to this guy. And then they snuck off at lunch and were taken and found that it wasn't drugs. So the next day they found this guy, led him out into a place, said they wanted some more, jumped on him, 
stripped his clothes off and tied him up and left him out there. Does that sound like a good behavior That's not pattern for an elementary school student? He was already in with people yeah. or part of the people that he shouldn't have been in with, doing things he shouldn't have been doing, mad because he didn't get the illegal stuff that he wanted, and willing really because what if this guy had, had a knife or something? Proverbs 29, 15. A spanking and a warning produce wisdom, but an undisciplined child disgraces his mother. It doesn't say a spanking and a warning force a child to do everything you want the child to do. It says it produces wisdom to know that there is an enforcement to rule. Part of the trouble with our world is people don't think rules should be enforced. When Maryland worked for parking services out there at USF, they were, there were people that violated every parking rule they had out there, did it flat on purpose, and came and lied off their face and got off. And the argument was, well, we won't like you, SF, if you make us pay that fine. But I have a child. Well, I bet when she was looking for a place to park, she already had that child. She didn't have it in the parking place. But our society doesn't believe the rules ought to be enforced. Go find, go, go find some real criminal. You know. don't, don't bother me. But a spanking physical discipline, the enforcement of a warning produces wisdom. So a person will think, something might happen if I do this. Undisciplined child disgraces his mother. Proverbs 29, 17. Correct your son, and he'll give you peace of mind. He will bring delight to your soul. Having said that, Discipline, even spanking, need not be cruel nor excessive. But the principle is that discipline enforces guidance. And if we don't think that children need guidance, we really need some help. We really need some help. Number four, so there won't be any misunderstanding. A father is not to be cruel to children. Ephesians 6, 4, and also Colossians 3, 21. Let's read that. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, how could you? Severe beatings, mindlessly given, can damage a child physically. Once in a while you read in the paper about somebody who killed a child because they were angry at the child. Angry at a baby that cried and wouldn't quit crying, so they killed it. And, and, it's, and they can be damaged emotionally. Fathers, too, have tempers to control. Probably the worst spanking is when the parent is angry. And yet, kids can do things that make parents angry, and children need to learn that. It needs to be okay to say, what you did made me angry. Not just I didn't like what you did, but what you did made me angry. When I get over this angry, I'm going to enforce some discipline. Anyway, discipline is a vital part of the father. And yet there's lots of circumstances <coughs> when the father may not be able to do exactly what God asked him to do. Number five. 
A father is to have family authority. You know, we were talking about mothers, and mothers have to have children. Women have to have the children. If there's going to be any children, it comes from the woman. Not because she's been bad, but because of Eve. You know, and God said, here's the way things are going to work. Women are going to do the bearing of the children. Well, guess what? There's a lot of guys who might arguably be, of whom it might be said they have no right, they, they don't need to be in authority over anything. Having said that, God says the husband is supposed to have the authority in the family. When we talked about this at school, I would always tell the kids, the girls, think about it. Why would you date somebody you wouldn't want to marry? Why would you marry somebody that you couldn't trust to have the Christian kind of authority in the marriage? Well, that, because we do what we do when we're young and we're stupid and all that, yeah. Having said that, if you had the choice, you could at least keep it in mind. Better, you know, we don't always think at times like that. Ephesians 5, 23 and 24. It starts on the bottom of page 2, goes to the top of page 3. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. It is his body. He is its Savior. As the church is under Christ's authority, so wives are under their husband's authority in everything. So if, you know, if while I'm dating, the guy says, let's all go get drunk, or let's all get, maybe, I would say, wait a minute, let's back off from it. That's not the kind of authority God had in mind. But such things are, I wouldn't say idealistic. Uh, they're of the nature of what we hope for that would make a sound marriage would be to have a, a husband who's responsible. A husband who will undertake providing for the family. Uh, a, a husband will step up and be willing to make the decisions that authority has to make. So husbands, fathers, are asked to do something by God that they may not care for either. But you know what? If there's no authority in the family, you have what's called anarchy. There's no authority among the people who have anarchy. There are no rules. Anybody does anything they want to do anytime. And it doesn't take long to realize that's very bad. It doesn't make the rule giver perfect. It doesn't make the rule keeper perfect. It just has to be authority. Authority is a God-given principle. And the father in a family is an example of it. Ephesians 6 1, let's read that. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. When I taught the kids at school, if, if there was a word they had been taught not to use, but it was in the Bible, I would say, use some other word for it. Don't worry about it. Obey your parents. That's right. Now, you move in to learn what that word means, but if their parents don't even want them to say that word out loud, don't say that word out loud. This authority is not a dictatorship, but the father or husband is to be responsible to his authority relationship as appointed by God. 
I think it's pretty obvious that when husbands desert the family, it's the opposite of what's supposed to be happening. Number six. This gets left out all the time in discussions in church and everything. If we can go down to the bottom of the page first, it will help us get there. Go to the bottom of page 3 where it says Ephesians 5, 21 through 22. And it's talking about Christians. Christians in a Christian community, Christians in a church. Let's read those two verses. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. The verses are jammed together. They can't be by accident. He tells Christians, Submit yourselves one to another, wives. Submit yourselves to your own husbands. Well, first of all, it doesn't say wives, submit yourselves to other husbands. And there's a lot of guys think that. But it also says submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. If we can't understand how in the world that could possibly happen, then we not, should not consider ourselves prepared to make great statements about what submission is. Now, let's go back up the page to the asterisk by 6. A father is to promote Mutual submission honored by the family. Colossians 3, 18 through 19, let's read that. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as it is suitable in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now, I'd like to tell you I was never bitter against Marilyn. But she'd probably jump up and she's not feeling good and she'd probably faint. But on the way up, she'd holler, liar, liar. <laughs> it happens. It happens because life is hard. It happens because somebody loses a job or loses money or something breaks and you don't have the money to fix it and things are hard and People are arguing, and that's the way life works. But wives are submit to submit to their own husbands. Wait a minute. Husbands are to love their wives and not be bitter against them. Now, would you say that it's easier to be submissive to someone who treats you with love and is not bitter against you? Yeah. Ephesians 6, 2, 3. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. There's that word, honor. Honor. Our society does not match in treating people with honor. We've had some recent experience on a national level with people who thought honor was the only curse word, that honor was the only thing that should not be done. Whose motto seemed to be, to all outward appearance, never honor anybody. Not God's way. In our society, submission is perceived as the results of a dominance enforced against someone's will. You have to dominate people to make them submit to you. Many, many cannot conceive of people voluntarily submitting to one another 
out of love and respect, ungrudgingly holding each other in honor. It's tough. It's not easy to do that when all of society doesn't, or most of society doesn't. But here and there, there are people that honor each other, who treat each other with honor. You're coming honorable people. Not the way the world considers honor by giving them a medal, but they regard, oh I believe the Bible says regarding each as more valuable than yourself. First Peter 3, 7. Let's read that. Likewise you husbands well with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Do you suppose that if you've ever seen a bitter argument in church, or a bitter argument between Christians, do you suppose that at the time of that argument, each person was really conceiving of the other person as more valuable than themselves, that they were really honoring the other person, and that they were really trying to follow this, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. My opinion is that no, they're not. <laughs> they forgot God. <laughs> they are with, with their tempers aflame, arguing bitterly about the God of love of the Bible. <laughs> that's us, that's humans. We have to repent and pray. But it gives us somewhere to go, something to aim at. See, then Ephesians 5, 21, 22. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. Uh, there's an expression in social studies and things like that called cooperative administration. In cooperative administration, a business or whatever school or whatever it recognizes there has to be an authority. In school it would be the principal. In business it would be whoever's the boss. But in cooperative administration, the boss wants the input from the employees. Wants to know from them how are things going? Are you able to do your job? Anything I can do that would make getting your job done be easier, you know? Uh, cooperation. I had this shown to me when I was at the academy by a man that's very wise and things like that. They took a, a they had a, we didn't know what it was because we were blindfolded. People were paired up. And there was a rope it was put in your hand. And all you were told is your partner would tell you to pull the rope towards you or to give it a little slack. You had no idea what was happening. And so you sat there during this time while it, a little bit, a little, no, 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 pull it a little bit, oh, no, no. And, and you can't see it, you don't know what's happening. And finally, they let you take your mask off. And there's this thing with about 10 ropes off of it, spread out like the wagon wheel spokes. And the people are sitting in chairs out front. Of it. And the person blindfolded had one of those ropes, and in the middle of it was like a cap. I believe it was a block. And the idea was to get this block off of the ground and on top of another block and set it down. You see, all it took was one person not cooperating. And what happened? It wouldn't work. 
And I thought, what a wonderful way to, to show people the value of working together. You had to trust the person who was talking to you. You had to do what they said. But everybody worked together. And then it got done. And when problems or anything in the church or whatever it is are addressed that way, wonderful things can happen. When someone with a type A personality says, yeah, here's the way we're going to do this. Uh, and he's the boss you don't like. It, it makes things tough wherever you are. Cooperative administration of authority is often more effective than mindless bullying. And it also creates less rebellion. Sometimes you, you, haven't you ever said to yourself, they say I ought to do so much, I'd cut my throat before I do that. That's the last thing in the world I'd ever do. Because you didn't like the way they treat you. Had nothing to do with whether the rule itself was reasonable. It had to do with whether you were being honored, whether you were being rewarded. So, how does that work in a family? Okay, we're to honor the father. What if the father is a lout, a bully, drunkard, wasteful, that's really putting a burden on the wife and children to honor a rascal like that either. But what if he says, oh, there's a man I should be, and I'm going to work at being the man I should be to make it easier for them to be able to respect me, you know, and, and all of a sudden he'll find that he needs to consider what his wife wants, he needs to consider what his children want. Does it mean the child dictates to the parent? doesn't mean that the wife dictates to the husband. It just means that this one person is no longer a bully in charge of a family in his own mind. But he's the kind of father that God thinks he should be, setting up a framework that allows people to be submissive. Page four on a different realm than we normally think about because we think a lot about morals and stuff like that. A father is to understand justice, page four. A father is to understand justice and live righteously like all godly people. We're going to look on the back of this sheet that we started with on the back of this, and we'll read this together. Find the on your toe. Exodus 20, chapter 23, verses 1 through 9, teaching about righteousness. Let's begin. The Lord continue, never spread false rumors. Don't join forces with wicked people by giving false testimony. Never follow a crowd in doing wrong. When you testify in court, don't side with the majority to pervert justice. Never give special favors to poor people in court. Whenever you come across your enemy's ox or donkey, Wandering loose, be sure to take it back to him. Whenever you see that the donkey of someone who hates you has collapsed under its load, don't leave it there. Be sure to help him with his animal. Never deny justice to poor people in court. Avoid telling lies. Don't kill innocent or honest people because I will never declare that guilty people are innocent. Never take a bribe because bribes blind those who can see 
and deny justice to those who are in the right. Never oppress foreigners. You know what it's like to be foreigners because you were foreigners living in Egypt. So God's idea of justice is explained. And a Christian should never be involved in injustice in those different ways. Bribes or testifying for a poor man because the poor man has his sympathies. Testifying for a rich man because a rich man will give him some money. Uh, oppressing people because they make some money out of it. Very down to earth, real situations of justice. A father is to understand justice and live righteously, like all godly people. And to summarize what we read just now, don't join the wicked or pervert justice for or against the poor. Don't cheat your enemy, but help him in an emergency. Don't take bribes. Don't oppress anyone. Titus 2.12 Let's read that together. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. A lot of people enjoy their fictitious Christianity because in their mind they don't have to deny ungodliness. In their mind they don't have to deny worldly lust. In their mind, they don't have to be sober. They don't have to do what's right. They don't have to think what being godly in the present world is because, hallelujah, they're saved. And they can do what they want to do. Absolutely contrary to the Spirit of God, to the writings of God, anywhere you want to read. So a loving father is, to summarize, to provide for his children, to teach his children what's right, to discipline his children, not to provoke his children to wrath and discourage them, but to nurture them, to hold authority within his family, to promote mutual submission and a framework in which he's the authority, and to live righteously and practice justice. I don't know how many times I added an S on to remember and my computer did not want to leave it there. God remembers we make mistakes. We too should remember that and be merciful. We need to be merciful to children, we need to be merciful to fathers, we need to be merciful to mothers and children. Psalm 103, 13 through 14. Let's read that. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are not us. And so as a father, we need to remember our children. As a parent, we need to remember we're training children. They're not there yet. And it's more training. Uh, we're, we're training ourselves to be a parent. That's the way God makes it work. I, I, I say that because I came across something and bleep, 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 right out of a sociology book they were describing the absolutely perfect father. And I thought, yeah, sure. But for everything they claim to eat, all fathers must do this. No, no. Why? Because all children are the same. All children are different. Some are hard-minded, on the edge of rebellious when they're an infant. Some are just cooperative as anything. Some <laughs> just don't care. They're all different kinds of ways. And no one rule will always work to be what's right. So. We need to follow these principles 
And then we're left to do the best we can. We've got to have mercy on us all. Number 10 was selected as an invitation to solve. If we can help you with your soul's salvation, we ask you to make your needs known while we stand and say, Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Oh, to Him I safe from harm, that you will keep us healthy, and we pray the Lord that you will bless us to return here on next Lord's Day. We know the Lord that uh, as Christians we should always conduct ourselves in a manner that is uh, 
according to your word and pleasing in your sight. And we pray that through our actions and deeds that we can somehow inspire others to seek you out. We know that you hear all prayers, dear Lord, and that if it is your will, it will be done. We thank you, dear Lord, for the sacrifice made by your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for the remission of our sins, which gives us the avenue of forgiveness. This prayer we say in Jesus' name, amen.